Does Daredevil have a theme song? He doesn't, huh? He's never really been... It did have a theme tune where there was like blood and stuff and then ultimately the blood forms like the Daredevil cowl, which I hope we end up seeing. I um, think we will eventually. I think this is like his origin series. His origin season. What are you looking at? Oh, I just happened to stop above that little thing and yes, the picture, picture of Shaley and Wendley, Wendley came up. <laughs> yeah, it's weird. I, I was looking at pictures of her the other night for nefarious reasons. And like one out of every three pictures, she looks pretty. Yeah. At like premieres and stuff. And every other one, she's like, oh, you know, she, maybe she's not so pretty. Maybe there's something odd about her. Or We watched. But it's all just the angles and stuff. She is a really pretty girl. Yeah. She's just not as photogenic as some are. We watched that Stars Alive. The Fault in Our the Stars. Fault in Our Stars the other night. And yeah, I was thinking that because they made her not look that pretty. But the, the, that it was in service of the film in that case. Right. Yeah, I mean, it she doesn't look that pretty. Can be done. She's not one of those people where you're just like, oh, come on, it doesn't matter. You put some big glasses on her and some braces. She's, right, she's always going to look, you know. Yeah. Are we recording? We have been for five minutes. Oh, my Lord. <laughs> and we it's won't be able to use garbage. any of that, will we? But that's okay. What's this one called? That gets my goat. Really? Everybody, welcome to That Gets My Goat on the Doonstief Audio Fiction Magazine. Hey, everybody. Welcome. I'm Big Anklevich. And I'm Rich Outfield. <laughs> and this gets your goat. It really does. It really does. You know, there was a guy the other day who said in a comment that he didn't listen to That Gets My Goat because... He didn't like negative things. Yeah, he thought it was just about complaining about stuff, and I... I didn't say anything Why didn't about you say it, anything? I, I thought somebody, just... some listener would put him straight and say, oh, hey, they talk about Avengers and stuff. They talk, It's just, you know, it's not a, but nobody, not a goddamn thing. <laughs> I, maybe I still will, but yeah, I just thought it was interesting. I was like, no, it, it may have been about that for the first 10 episodes, but yeah, it didn't last for very long at all. Yeah, it's basically like an episode of the show without a story is all it is. Sometimes we have a topic worth talking about. Other times we just talk. Um, today we have a topic. Yeah, I, I was thinking, I was trying to ask you if Daredevil has some kind of a theme song, which the show itself obviously is going to have, but like not something like that, but I wanted like, you know, a, a Spider-Man, Spider yeah, something like that. Does he have some old song? But no, he doesn't. Well, the, there was the Evanescent song that they played into the friggin' ground on the 2003 Daredevil, the, you know, Wake me up inside, I can't get wide, what's that wrong with Daredevil? my dick? And that was all, and I don't know why I did it in the Creed voice, or, you know, <laughs> but... Uh, you can do better than that, little man. What? <laughs> That's well, from your story, sir. Call back. It was? Yeah. Baby talk, baby fish mouth. Uh, uncle, baby fish say, mouth is sweeping the nation. Say uncle. The baby is like, oh, what is that music? Oh, it's so wonderful. And the guy says, just greed, little man. You can do better. <laughs> right. Uh, uh, okay, so how did we... Oh, you asked if there's a Daredevil theme song. Not as far as I know, unless it's, Wear me up inside. I can sing like share. <laughs> Find a time back time. That's how I do share. Is I actually lower my voice. Yeah. You know, I could find a way. And the short answer is no. I don't think so. There, there is a theme song, but I've only heard it once. Yeah, me too. Because the one episode came out, and we both seen. I mean, I guess all the episodes came out. We've only seen the first episode, and we're going to talk about it. I'm sure we'll do later episodes about more of the series. Maybe. Uh, we never did with Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. I and I always intended for us to. We didn't do like weekly episodes, but we did an episode about when the show first came out, and then we did another one about when the second season started. So. Did we really? Yeah. So there's if that. If you say so. Agents of Steve. Is that what we called it? <laughs> oh, that's cute. Um, uh, unless you don't like negative things. But, yeah, Daredevil is Marvel Cinematic Universe's first show for Netflix. And, uh, I mean, it's not super obvious that it's part of the Marvel Cinematic Universe yet. 
But yeah, they released all the episodes at the same time, so you could binge watch them if you chose to. Thirteen shows? Thirteen episodes? <laughs> yes, thirteen episodes. And I know there are people that are just like, they spent that weekend watching them, and they got through, and, and that's fine, except for those guys are stuck for six to eight months until the next show starts. Is it going to be that long? I have no idea how long it is, I, I, but if you had a computer in front of you, you could find out. But for me, just watching one episode a week means that, you know, months from now, uh, when I'm done, it'll be like, oh, wow, only two more weeks until uh, AKA Jessica Jones starts. You know, it turns out I have a computer in front of me, and it says December 2015. So, yeah, it's, it's going to be a while before that next one comes out. But that's just six months, really, isn't it? April is it's the fourth eight months. month. Oh, okay. Eight but, months. Uh, I mean, it's not that bad, but it is a while. It's, it's not coming out, you know, just in June or something like that, which I would rather it do. But, uh, you know, whatever, it's got to be made... It's my first time that I want to watch one of these shows that was made specifically for Netflix. This isn't the first show that's been that way. They've had like Orange is the New Black and House of Cards, House of Cards, and and etc. They've had several shows that are like that, and they've always done it this way, where they do the whole season and drop it all at once, which is the way you watch stuff on Netflix. But it's not the way you watch TV shows. It's kind of the way you've always done it, but also not the way you've always done it. But you're not forced to. It's always, As far as I know, it's always going to be available. So it's not like you have three weeks to watch all 13 episodes before they take them away. Or, you know, before your TiVo gets full. Right. Um, so there are people who are finished already. And then there are people like me who are just you know, going to parcel them out. And, you know, to each their own. Sometimes it's rewarding to sit and watch a show six or five or eight episodes in a row because you pick up on things that you wouldn't if you parceled them out week to week to week to week. But other times a show is more rewarding if you watch an episode, you talk to your friend about it, say, I can't wait for the next episode. Then you watch that one and you talk about it. And, you know, It gives you something to look forward to, to come up with different theories and oh, I'll bet, I wonder if they go this way or I mean, he, he said this. I'll bet that's building up to something else and all that. So I, that's how I prefer to watch stuff. But at the same time, sometimes you're just like, oh, I'm so glad we don't have to wait a whole week to get part two of this cliffhanger. Or whatever. You know what I mean? Yeah. We talked a lot about community or we will talk a lot about community <laughs> depending on how the episodes drop. And yeah, I watched a lot of community in a short amount of time and and i think i may have picked up on more of the special in jokes because of that but i know there are people that will watch an entire season of a show in one weekend and a i don't have time like that available to me but yeah i mean when i say a lot or watched a lot of community i watched like four episodes and they're half hour episodes you know in a day or in even a week so it's it's different than trying to watch the whole thing right away like that yeah it was spring break last week for the schools around here and my friends kids all had the week off and you had the week off too your kids did rather right wait did had... you take the week off so that you could be with your kids or what what ha happened with that i did yeah i took some of the week off i only did wednesday through friday Anyway, my friend Jeff's teenage son and his girlfriend decided that one day they were going to marathon the Lord of the Rings movies. One day they were going to marathon the Hobbit movies. And here, wait for it. One day they were going to marathon the Harry Potter movies. And that's just an unbelievable amount of time watching movies. I mean, holy if, if you and I wrote it down, we would be sick. Uh, it would become that negative show that the guy thought it would that gets my goat becomes but when you're young you can do stuff like that like oh you know what we'll always be young <laughs> this summer is going to last forever winter is not coming <laughs> and so it's just a different thing avengers 2 is coming out shortly and there are a lot of theater chains that are doing this ultimate marvel marathon where they're going to show all the marvel cinematic universe movies that's not even appealing to me apparently it's 27 hours long so you get there at like 6 o'clock Thursday, 
and you sit there until eight o'clock Friday. And, you know, there's a, a spot in between each movie where you can go defecate and stuff. But that's it. But dude, that does not sound fun to me. That sounds a, exhausting. Do they sounds, have a spot where you can eat food so that you could defecate it out later? Well, I, yes, I, I believe that spot is called Iron Man 2. Ah, uh, sorry. That's a joke because I didn't think Iron Man 2 was very good. Anyway, uh, they're actually having that in our community or I saw, area or whatever. I saw a and billboard it, I didn't it. even look to see how much it was. I, I don't care. I don't want to go see that. I'm just too old. To waste that much time. <laughs> I assumed it was just you watch Avengers 1 and then watch Avengers 2. I didn't realize it was an entire... Well, the, see, that's the, the ultimate Marvel marathon is all 12 movies. To, or 11 movies. I don't know which it is. But there are theaters that are showing Avengers 1 and immediately afterward Avengers 2. And that I would be down for in a second, in a heartbeat. The last time I saw Avengers was in the theater. I'm not a video guy. I would rather see movies in the theater where you focus on them. You know, at this point, I, I don't even know why I buy these DVDs. Because I'll watch <laughs> yeah. the special features, and DVDs don't even have special features anymore. It's so, like, if you wanted to watch special features, you'd buy the Blu-ray, son. That's right. And so uh, I will buy them, and then they just go to waste, or my nephews watch them, which is sort of worse than them going to waste because they end up getting scratched. Anyway, I'm preaching to the choir here. That's right. Because you have kids think... that just use DVDs as frisbees. Yeah, they use them as dinner plates. And then they try and play them afterwards. Still has ketchup and chunks of lettuce from their cheeseburger. <laughs> but And the thing with Avengers 1 and 2 is I would like to do it, but not enough to like take a day off from work or whatever and, and inconvenience myself. And again, it's just I'm getting old that I don't care about that anymore. When Return of the King came out, I so had to see it opening night that I was willing to buy a 1.30 a.m. ticket when I had to be at work the next morning. So we went to the Arclight Cinema there in Hollywood at the 1.30 a.m. movie for an almost four-hour movie, and it was light when the movie let out. Um, so I went home and showered, brushed my teeth, and then went to work. And I would never do that today. It's just like, I'm sorry, guys. Why not just see it the next day when you can get a 6 o'clock show or whatever? And... You can get a 6 o'clock show, and it's less full of annoying, screaming teenagers. And you get the sleep so you don't have to keep slapping your face to keep yourself awake, even though it's a good movie. Right. And, you know, I sound like a hypocrite because... I've complained that my dad was upset when I took my niece to, to the Harry Potter, the final book launch, which was at midnight. And he's like, no good Christian girl should be out at midnight <laughs> and all that stuff. But that was an event where you had to be there at midnight. It, you, there weren't different showings right? and all that stuff. And that's something that she will remember, that we went to a book launch. Wait, how many times are there book launches in a person's life? Very few because books aren't a big deal. Right. That's one of those things. I don't mean to be a hypocrite, but it's just there are some things where it felt so important to be first. It felt so important to be there at the moment. And as much as I want to see Avengers 2, and I do, I don't have to see it before everybody else. I don't have to fight the crowds or whatever. And, you know, if you and I end up going to see it Saturday noon, that's okay. Or Monday, we've done that plenty where we go and see whatever it is we want on Monday and then podcast about it afterwards. That's true. But uh, yeah, we're not going to do that with Avengers. Still, I mean, <laughs> That'll be the third this time. This is still a big, it. big enough deal to uh, want to <laughs> see it before everybody's like, oh, I love the part where Black Panther showed up at the end with a giant erection. Wait, what? No, no, I didn't see that yet. And they got a wig guy playing him. Oh, hey, R-O-A-T, cut, cut that part out. That was, felt very insensitive. It, black people don't have erections. Okay, so we were talking about Daredevil, and, and that was a roundabout way of saying, I don't need to see all of the Daredevils right after each other, you know, in the same day. But knowing that there are 12 more to go, I'm really excited, because I dug this first episode of Daredevil. Yeah, me too. It was a, it was a really good episode. And, and Daredevil is one of those characters... Yes, there's been a movie of Daredevil before, which, when it comes down to it, is about all the exposure I've ever had to Daredevil. I really know almost nothing about Daredevil. I'd never, I don't think before that first movie came out, I'd ever even heard of the character. Of course, that was a long time ago, 
when Marvel was not everywhere ubiquitous the way it is now. So it was a lot easier to know nothing about Daredevil. Because Daredevil's not a nobody character. He's not a top tier character, but he's not the one that you just, you've never ever heard of this guy kind of a thing. No, but would, it, well, would it be safe to say that Daredevil is the poor man's Spider Man? Would that be okay to say? Yeah, I think poor people live in Hell's Kitchen. Well, I, I, I... All right. <laughs> At least that's the way they portray it all the time in Daredevil. But yeah, I'd never really heard of him before that, and so I know very little about it. Uh, when I started watching the show, and you see Karen Page for the first time, I went, oh, oh, and I pulled my phone out as I watched it, <laughs> looked up Karen Page. I'm like, I know that name. That name sounds familiar. What? Well, wait, how did that name sound familiar? Because, you know me, I, I'm a Marvel guy, so I knew who Karen Page was. But your average person is not going to know that. Well, I guess I'm not your average person. Well, where person. did you know her from? Because she was dead by the time you started reading comics. I don't know where I knew, knew her from, but I recognized her name. I okay. must have somehow seen her in something because, yeah, the name sounded familiar. And so I looked it up and, you know, got myself a... Knew that she was more than just a, a no, nothing character. You know, she wasn't just going to be a one episode kind of a person, which was cool. But yeah, I don't know. One thing about this show, and I had this warning from you beforehand, because you watched the first episode before I did. You told me it had dropped, and I was like, oh, okay, cool. I can't wait to watch it with the five-year-old, you said. <laughs> I didn't say that, but I said, yeah, me and the kids will have to watch some of that this weekend. And you texted me back and said, hey, this is not a kid's show. And I said, oh, who will be able to handle it? I mean, how, how much of a not a kid's show is it? How bad is it? And you're like, oh, it's really dark and violent. And I said, okay, well. And my wife asked me to ask you if it was, what did she use as a, as a com comparison? Well, you asked if it was worse than Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. And I said, yes, but then I remembered, spoiler alert, guys, that Sky's mother was vivisected alive <laughs> on Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., which is one of the worst things. I mean, it's a, you know, that's a Game of Thrones level awful thing to happen to a character. And I thought, well, okay, you know, it's not that bad. But, uh, but do you get the impression this is a show for grown-ups, though, while you watch Daredevil? Uh, yeah, you eventually convinced me that I needed to watch the first episode by myself without the children just to make sure what level it was at and was um, that wrong no i was i think it was probably a good idea okay it was very dark and it was very violent well let and... me interrupt i'm sorry captain america 2 the winter soldier was for grown-ups but i took my then five-year-old nephew to it anyway and i was just digging it because it's such a good movie i just forgot that he's a little little kid and that he's not going to get some of this stuff but the point where I realized, oh, shoot, maybe I shouldn't have brought a five-year-old to it, is when Winter Soldier kicked that guy into the propeller of one of the hovercraft or whatever. And my nephew said, is he all right? I was like, oh, shoot. <laughs> uh, this I, I just took a kid to a grown-up show. You said, oh, well, the funny thing is, when we went and saw that show, that was the day that my son would not go to bed. And so I brought my, yeah, he was two years old You then. brought your squalling infant to that room. <laughs> and he did sleep through a lot of it, luckily, but he kept waking up and going, Captain America! <laughs> That's right. Every he time would, you'd see him, he'd point and yell he'd his name. point to Captain America, and he would point to Scarlett Johansson's chest. Those were the two things that he yeah. really impressed him. <laughs> he'd say, I'm hungry. <laughs> <laughs> Um, <laughs> he was flashing back to the crib. Oh, gosh. Uh, no, that was a movie for grown-ups. And I think this show, I wouldn't have expected to show this to the three-year-old anyways. Basically, the one that I'm trying to figure out whether they're old enough for it or not is my 11-year-old daughter. She has kind of discerning tastes. She really likes Flash, but she's not all that keen on Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., well, Flash, um, I think, is a more kid-friendly show. I, mean, I think so, Flash too. Flash tends to be pretty brightly lit and enjoyable. I mean, there's some dark stuff in there, but not dark on the level of, like, neo-Nazis and stuff that are happening on, on S.H.I.E.L.D. 
But, uh, you know, this reminds me, uh, this is an ad for my other show called Delusions of Grandeur that I do with Marsha Latham. We interviewed Gino Moretto over there, and he told us that his wife absolutely forbade their children from seeing the Star Wars trilogy until they were eight years old. That was the cutoff. Huh. And, yeah, Marshall is way more conservative than I am. But both of us were just like, oh, wow, that is just child abuse. Anyway, <laughs> we just couldn't get our minds around that because the Star Wars trilogy, holy cow, that, you know, yeah. that's like not letting your kid go out and play in the snow or open presents on Christmas morning or... Is it the, the, the women that refuse the teat to the child <laughs> uh, bring us back to Scarlett Johansson. So try, it was trying to figure out where whether she would be cool to sit down and watch it or not. I think my 13 and 15-year-old can probably handle it. It is dark, and a friend of mine at work watched the first four episodes over the weekend, and he said that I should probably withhold judgment until I even get in further, because it... It goes down a dark path. Keeps, right? keeps going dark. So it, maybe it's not quite ready. Uh, you know, I, I compared the show to maybe a Dark night level of darkness and violence. There's some dark stuff, but most of the violence violence was just, you know, a bunch of karate fighting. Right, but there was consequences to the violence. You People got hurt. It wasn't cartoony right. violence. And, you know, you and I have both seen stuff where, you know, there's just wanton destruction, and then they're able to say, no, nope, nobody was killed. Thank goodness. I remember in Batman Begins, where he's like, thank goodness no one was killed. And I was like, what the hell? How was no one killed? You know, and, and so it's just one of those things where it's there is consequences, and that makes it feel heavier. Right. You know what I mean? Where somebody can take a beating and then the next day they go to work and they just live their life and, and you're just like, oh, okay, so there's no consequences to that. But somebody takes a beating and they have to miss the next day at work and stay inside so nobody sees, you know, the mess that their face has become or whatever. You're just like, well, there was consequences to what that guy did. That feels more like real life, you know, more heavy. Some, the beating that Matt took at the end of that first episode, you felt it. Because this is a human being, and it shocked me that he was a human being. Because to prepare me for the show, my friend Jeff got me an omnibus. You know what those omnibus, omnibi are? Those are the big buses. It's a giant hardback people, right? Marvel Comics collection that cost a fortune. And it was really neat. But he bought this, and he said, I expect you to have this read by the time Daredevil starts. Because he got one for him, and he got one for me, and then we're both going to read it. And in the comics... He's basically Spider-Man. Spider-Man can web swing and he can do all this stuff and he has a sixth sense that warns of things and Daredevil has all this stuff and he goes web spinning too or swinging only it's on a billy club instead of web shooters or whatever. And he, But he fights supervillains and all this stuff and I was just like, oh, so this guy is superhuman. That's kind of cool. And then I saw the Daredevil series and he's a man. And I thought, oh, oh gosh, well, what was going on in those comics? It's kind of like if you ever watched the Clone Wars Tartakovsky cartoon where the Jedi could fly and stuff. You're just like, wow, these guys are awesome. And then episode three comes out and one lightsaber swing and they're dead. Or somebody shoots them with a blaster and they're dead. And you're like, oh, wait, maybe Jedi aren't superheroes, aren't Neo in the Matrix. Which do I trust? And yeah, it's just I was really surprised by that because beyond superhuman in the comic books that I was reading. And, and, you know, they're comics, so people can do whatever they want. But he's clearly a human being who could get shot. or who, It hurts if you hit him with a bat who could be killed on this show. But I'll tell you something, that makes me care more to know that he's a human being and to know that when somebody punches him in the stomach, that hurts him. And he chooses to fight on because he's a good guy. Because nobody's going to stop the bad guys unless he does. That's what a hero is. Anyway, I'm saying that the show was dark and it was gritty and, and, you know, it was bloody and stuff. But that actually made me like the show more. Yeah, sometimes that is important. Even when it comes to kids watching shows, you know, that one of the things that a lot of people complain about, especially with like PG-13 films, 
is that violence without consequences kind of a thing, you know. People just fight, they blow things up, and, and, and it's no big deal. And it's kind of like video games, you know, it's just, there's no consequences. And people don't understand what it means um, for violence. And then you have kids that'll do stupid crap, like they'll watch Beavis and Butthead throw a bowling ball off of a freeway overpass. And they're like, we should try that in real life. And they'll go and do it and kill somebody. Because they were never taught that things like that have consequences. It, it's definitely an interesting thing. I do like that, that when there's violence, there's going to be consequences for it. Because that's the truth. And, you know, it's, it's always kind of weird when you have superhero shows. And you have these superhumans that, yeah, I mean, there's not it's not their power. And yet somehow they can take an endless beating and still be fine. Their power is, I don't know, that they have spidey sense or, or whatever. They have strength, but they're not invulnerable. They don't, there's a lot of uh, uh, superhero shows that are like that. I'm trying to think of a particular example, but I don't know. You just take, for example, Storm, whose power is to control the weather. That's what her power is. Her power isn't that she could take up a great beating in a fight and still be fine. If she gets punched once, she should get knocked out. You know what I mean? Because that's not what she is. She's not Wolverine where he gets punched and his power is that he heals really fast and so he can take a whole massive beating and be fine. You know, like Scott, for example, Cyclops, if he gets hit, it should really do some damage because his power isn't to, you know, he's not invulnerable. Um... Batman is this there's a real example. I mean that guy is just a guy. He's just a human being, and yet somehow I mean, yeah, Bane broke his back, but he fought a lot more guys that should have done a lot more damage to him and yet didn't. I mean, yeah, he did groan, I guess, that one time when Alfred woke him up early, because bats are nocturnal. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've seen it done with varying levels of success and, and without and, and you know I'm, I, we haven't invoked the worst example and, and we won't but you know they were talking about what had happened in New York and they don't say how long it's been since the Avengers in Daredevil's first episode but they're still rebuilding this property values are still down in these areas that have been destroyed because of the Chitari invasion and that to me was rad that they didn't beat you over the head with it but they said this is the same universe guys that kind of thing was neat. And if we think about it, I mean, how many people would have died with a giant mechanical space worm destroying buildings left and right and things like, you know what I mean? Yeah. We haven't had a number or anything like that, but I guess thousands of people. Yeah, at least. And I like, I think we've talked about in other episodes, you know, the, the biggest disaster money wise, at least. In the United States was when the Twin Towers were destroyed in New York. It was more than a billion dollars. And that was two buildings. And, you know, we've talked about the worst example, which we're not going to bring up. But various movies in the time since then have brought down building after building after building in various cities. You know, the, the Transformers movie... You know, you see all these buildings getting destroyed. I, I want to say it was Chicago where they did that. I don't know. I didn't watch it. But, you know, here and there and everywhere, they're, they're bringing down buildings. Superman, Avengers, et cetera, et cetera. It's nice to see, so, again, something like that because there's consequences. We're seeing that, yeah, New York did not make it out unscathed. And yeah, thousands, I would say tens of thousands of people probably were injured or killed in that incident it would be something you know the the 911 memorial tower i think it was last year that they just finished it which is almost 15 years later so you know it's it's something that should take a long time to make up for unless you know some super builder comes along Bob the Builder gets superpowers and can fix up the city real fast. That's what they need. Superpowered people that can uh, super repair things. 
That's his power. I have the power to lay a thousand bricks in five minutes. Well, I mean, if Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. had a budget and they could shoot outside of Los Angeles, maybe you'd see stuff like that where it's just like, okay, some contractor became a billionaire overnight trying to rebuild New York after that. And you know, it's like, and what part did Stark have to play in all that? And, you know, it's like, funny, his building is still standing. I mean, and maybe they'll address it in Avengers 2. It's like, what has happened in the years since that? And, uh, you know, if, if your family was killed by the Chitauri invasion, I think you would blame all aliens. You would blame Thor. You would blame, you know, it's like, well, where, where were the Avengers before? Why didn't they prevent that and all that stuff? You know, it, there are some people that would be glad that the Avengers saved lives. But there would be other people that's like, no, you know, before these people came, these heroes came, we never had destruction on that level. And that sort of stuff is really interesting. How many people died when those helicarriers started dropping out of the sky? And maybe it wasn't on a populated area and all that stuff, but still people had to die. I mean, just every one of those helicarriers had to have thousands of people in them, right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> Poor uh, Danny Pudi was on one of those helicarriers, so... <laughs> Did he live or die? I don't know. They do... I do remember them dealing with those kind of things here and there. Like, I remember the first episode of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Mike Peterson has his little boy, and, you know, he's looking at the toys of the superheroes, and, you know, they talk about how kids are maybe afraid of things like that now, as well as, you know, they think they're neat. And of course there was Iron Man 3 where he has his panic attacks and stuff whenever he hears talk of the events of what happened in New York. And they ask him what was in the wormhole. So they've dealt with it somewhat, but it's nice to see that they're still dealing with it. Um, it, it adds a good element of realism. Right, in the last Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. that you and I saw, they go, there's some place out in the woods where there's a cabin, a rustic cabin, and it turns out it's not just a rustic cabin. It's got like 18 inches of concentrated steel in the walls. And it's a place that Bruce Banner went to be by himself where he couldn't hurt anybody when he hulked out. And I thought that, that was really, really neat. You know, the first thing he says in Avengers when he wakes up as Banner is, did I hurt anyone? And, you know, the guilt that that man has to carry around on his shoulders is, you know, he, he's kind of like the world's worst drunk. <laughs> who blacks out and, you know, he wakes up and he's like, what did I do? But it's, how many people did I kill? What, you know, what happened? What did the Hulk do? Which is terrifying. I mean, to lose control at that level. And, you know, maybe in Avengers 2, he will have controlled it a little bit more and he doesn't have to worry about that. But I don't know, because we're never going to see a solo Hulk movie again, so. <laughs> we will see Hulk fight Hulk Buster, though. But this isn't about Avengers 2. We're talking about Daredevil. One thing that my wife said that I thought was kind of interesting is that, and I guess it really kind of goes with the whole series, she was looking at the guy who they have playing Matt Murdock, and she said, you know, all these other superhero guys, they just have a look that's really, you know, they're really good looking or whatever it is about them. This guy that's Matt Murdock just looks like a normal guy. Oh, he doesn't look like a really hot dude or, or any, it just looks like a dude. Interesting. And I can tell somebody who's supermodel type guy, you know what I mean? But to, to judge <laughs> varying levels of which guy is attractive or right, not, but, I'm not so good at that. I, but I can, Hemsworth, he looks like a god. Right. Like that's what I'm saying. Like a perfect person, you know what I mean? Yeah, Chris Hemsworth or Chris Evans, you know, you look at those guys and, oh yeah, those are hunks. <laughs> Whatever you want to say. I mean, even... Do, do people use that word anymore? Probably not, but it doesn't... I don't use that word to begin with because I'm generally... Because this is a 21st century, that's what you're thinking. Yeah, yeah. No, it's just, I don't swing that way, so, you know, I don't generally know... The small increments. I can't look at a guy and say, this guy looks normal. This guy looks attractive. But I can look at someone and say, okay, this guy is a hunk. and <laughs> This guy is not kind of a thing. And I can see that Chris Hemsworth and Chris Evans, for example, are head and shoulders better looking than Matt Murdock. But Really? Because that guy was the lead in Stardust. And I remember girls just going, oh. When Stardust came out, I mean, Stardust was only a hit here. 
<laughs> Nobody else saw Stardust, but you know, it was one of those movies that girls really liked here. And I thought that he was really handsome in that, but they, they do plain him up in this show and he's always got stubble and, and stuff. Uh, but like, um, Mark Ruffalo who plays Banner, he's not a hunk, right? No, I wouldn't call him a hunk. He's got a kind of a, aw shucks kind of niceness to him that might appeal to people, but he's not a Chris Hemsworth looking kind of guy. And apparently, neither is this Matt Murdock guy, at so least your according wife, to my wife. Your wife dug him because he was a normal guy, or she's like, oh, this guy's just a normal guy? Uh, I don't think that it was either way. It was just, meh, he's a normal guy. That's just different from what other shows are like. Okay. Didn't look like, for example, Agent Ward from Agents oh, of Oh, okay. Shield, Agent Ward was, is a, uh, an Adonis kind yeah, of Yeah, he's really attractive and buff and super capable kind of a thing yeah you're 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 phil colson's Ooh, yeah, yeah whoa, whoa, like whoa. chiseled out of stone <laughs> these perfect dudes I, don't know, I just really like phil colson i do too but it's for the reason that i like mark ruffalo they're not that they're a different kind of a of a likable person what about foggy nelson what's your thought there he's fun he's uh obviously supposed to be a sidekick but not a sidekick to Daredevil. I don't think he's just a sidekick to Matt Murdock. I like is, that, yeah. is interesting. But yeah, he's just like a fun guy that uh, I'm sure he'll have his moments. He seems like he might be more of the bright spot. He's more cynical in a way than, than uh, Matt Murdock is. Matt Murdock is... Uh, well, Matt Murdock is idealistic. Right. He's, he's pie in the sky, but... Foggy Nelson is the comic relief. Yeah, but he's also the realistic guy where he's just like, oh, you have no money? Okay, see ya. Because <laughs> it turns out we're in this business to make money. <laughs> you know, that kind of a, a, a cynicism. But fun. And I, I look forward to what we may have from him in the future. Um, hopefully he'll have some enjoyable bits. Yeah, I, I don't think he knows about Matt's abilities yet. And so that'll be fun to see him discover that. I'm assuming that will happen during this show. Okay, so, yeah, they, they, they introduced those two. They introduced Karen Page, who I, I really liked. What's her name? Deborah Jo Wall, something like that? Help me out. Deborah Ann Wall. Okay, Deborah Ann Wall. She, I, I knew her from True Blood. I, I like her. She, she, uh, had a vulnerability that I really liked in the show and, we will see more of her as well. And who else did they introduce in that first episode that we will see more of? Well, there's various wrongdoers. We get the guy who keeps telling us about his employer. What's the word? I wanted to say maitre d', but that's not the right word. There's a... Major domo? There you go. The major domo for the kingpin. I assume it's the kingpin. Obviously, we haven't seen further on, but it's Daredevil, so it's going to be the kingpin that is... His employer. He never uses anything other than my employer. We don't say his name. I thought that was really cool. They never once said any any name, but we have him. We have various other bad guys that get together and have a little meeting. You have the Chinese woman and the Japanese guy, and then there's an American guy, and then there's like these Russian dudes. Yeah, there were right? like two Russian guys. And they, yeah, they're all involved in some really effed up stuff. Like the first thing you see in the show is some human trafficking where they're trying to shove some women into a storage container to get shipped off to who knows where. And uh, they might get a bucket. Yeah, if they behave, they'll get a bucket. But see, and Daredevil just beat that guy so senseless yeah. that, I, that I was disappointed to see him walking around later in the show. I really was. But there's the the fat guy who's just watching, and he does nothing the entire time. So Daredevil does pick something up and throw it at him, which I thought was really And amazing. knocks him into the water. But we saw him do the billy club thing where he throws it and it bounces. And it was really neat because you could see him, like, I, I don't know, do the math in his head or the angle of where he'd have to throw it to get it to bounce and ricochet and hit some guy. And that was neat to me. It's like, oh, okay, because you see Daredevil do that a million times in the comics, but you never see what would it actually take to get something to bounce like that. I don't know. I, I was really appreciative of that one shot. But yeah, we get all those people introduced, and there's a cop 
that calls them and tells them about the weirdness. I, I assume he, he'll probably come up again uh, throughout the series as like some kind of a dude who tells them, oh yeah, you need to help this person out kind of a thing. That's probably it. Yeah, I don't know. Do you think it seemed like at the end they made it out to be that this that Karen Page has no idea who the masked man was? I don't think so. I don't think she does. Um, do you think that she suspects? I think at this point, just because Matt is blind, people immediately discount him, which I, I love. I like that because he really is blind. So he's never going to be suspected as being this vigilante. And eventually, he's going to give himself away in some way. That's that's my guess, but I don't know. We'll see. I mean, just the pummeling that guy's face must have taken should be <laughs> enough to give him away, but we'll see. The other thing that we haven't really talked about is they flash back to his origin as a child with Batlin Jack Murdoch. What was the dad's name? Something like that. Oh, there was a poster on the wall at the the, the boxing club where where Matt goes to exercise, oh, right. and it said Crusher Creel versus Battling Matt Hogan. And Crusher Creel is the absorbing man. And I just loved that. Oh, my gosh. Battling Jack Murdoch, yep. Did the show start with the accident? With the no, boy? the first thing was him saving those girls from the, uh, the shipping human container. trafficking bit before then I think they went to the theme song the intro the what do they call that title sequence yeah and then i think they showed his flashback to becoming blind but we, yeah we will get to see more of the origin of you know his abilities as a child and all that i think as the show goes along and eventually we'll probably see what inspired him to put on the mask and go out and yeah. People complain a lot. I mean, I know we live in a cynical age, but people complain about the origin stories. It's like, oh, please, I don't want to ever see an origin story again. You know, the people complained about Superman putting glasses on in that last movie. So, yeah, there, you know, but I think that this origin story had to be told, and I enjoyed every moment when they'd flash back to him as the little boy. And, and I can't wait to see, I mean, it's awful, but I can't wait to see what happens to his dad that you know, inspires him. I've got to be somebody that looks out for others and all that. I, I can't wait to see that happen because they're parceling it out. They just don't hit you over the head with it. They're giving you a little bit here and a little bit there so that, you know, it's like, oh, I, I have three pieces of the puzzle and after four more pieces, I'll see what the puzzle is going to be. And that's a really clever thing that you can do when you have a broad canvas to paint. Yeah. On. When you have 13 hours of episodes to put it on. It's interesting, too. I think this whole, probably this whole first season of this series could probably be considered the origin season. And maybe it'll even be longer. I mean, he's just wearing a black mask, which is not, I mean, obviously they're, you know, building toward the whole Daredevil outfit because it's in that opening sequence, the credit sequence, title sequence, theme song, whatever. Uh, <laughs> It's there, the blood comes down and forms into that daredevil shape. So you know that they're building toward that at some point, but right now all he's do is just a dude in black. And yeah, it's like you said, he's just a man. He he doesn't seem to have maybe a handle on all the powers. He can obviously he can fight really awesome and he can use his kind of radar or whatever senses to uh you know see things and be able to use them. But uh, I assume, I mean, I don't know what all powers he even has. You read well, the they Omnibus, what does he have? They haven't hit you over the head with it yet either. Uh -huh. not, but the, see, the, do, the Daredevil in the comics, like I said before, is so superhuman that some of it seems like magic. In the same way that sometimes Peter's spider sense is just magic. You, know, you can't explain it away as a, a hyper-reactive sense of danger or, you know... Or having, you know, un unbelievably fast reflexes. It's magic. And stuff that Matt can do in the comics is he can read a newspaper with his finger because his se sense of touch is so heightened that he can feel the ink print and, and different levels. And, and he can feel a picture on a newspaper and know who the picture is of and all that stuff. That's just magic. 
he he has some extraordinary sense of balance because of his extrasensory perception where you know he can like walk on a high wire on his tippy toes or on his fingertips and all that stuff which is just magic but it's okay I, because if you accept the idea that and and I think it's the truth that if you take away a man's sight his other senses compensate compensate and that if you increase that to a superhuman level that yeah a man could hear a heartbeat when he's talking to somebody and know if they're telling the truth or not and we see that in that first episode when he's right. talking to Karen Page he's asking her questions or you know he can smell somebody's perfume and know who it is across the room which seems unbelievable but if your sense of smell were that strong sure you know, I think it's things like that. Where and at the very end of the episode, he does the Superman thing, where he goes up onto the the building and he just listens, and, and you know, and you hear him just like focus his listening here. Okay, keep going, and then you hear help or something like that, and he focuses on somebody in trouble, and that's where he's gonna go. And I, dude, I love that. I love the idea of that he's just he's patrolling or whatever. He's out there, and what can I see basically? And there's somebody who needs me, and that's where I'm going to go next. I, I just the show satisfied me, and it moved me, and it got me really excited to watch more episodes of the show. And that's what a pilot episode should do. And and I totally understand the people that were like, I can't wait. I'm going to watch them all. You know, I'm not that guy, but I can understand that. It I'm going to watch me. them all. Oh, okay. But I can't wait. I mean, it's just going to take me a little longer than most. This kind of thing is neat. It was an experiment. Marvel Studios hadn't done that before. And, you know, I think Agent Carter was an experiment, too. And we should have done an episode about Agent Carter. I, I feel bad that we didn't. But, We've uh, talked about it here and there, though. It's not yeah. like it's an untouched subject. But I'm sure that they will learn things from Daredevil that they will apply to Jessica Jones, which they will apply to Luke Cage, which they will apply to Iron Fist, which they will apply to the Defenders. Um you know, everything is going to be a little bit easier, a little bit better, and, and all that stuff. And it's great that all of those shows are going to get their full run. That it's not, you know, oh, you know, six episodes in, Fox decided to cancel the show. Kind of right. Thing. We're going to get to see all of those. Partly because the coffers are just endless with Marvel Cinematic Universe right, right. now. Right. But that's neat. How much do you think any of the other cinematic... I mean, we did talk about how they mentioned the incident how much do you think any of the other cinematic universe stuff will intrude upon these shows we know obviously that there will be some interplay between the four series and then eventually they will combine and be the defenders but will there be anything agents of shield related in there will there be anything coming in from the avengers 2 movie etc that will intrude, do you think? Will there be a cameo of somebody? Will <laughs> Lady Sif make an appearance on this show? My guess is no, not on Daredevil. Um, I mean, if it were my show, of course there would be. And I would put something in every single dang episode. And I would be stealing. I'd be saying, you know, hey, there's the Daily Bugle that he happens to be reading. F Sony and all that. So, although... At this point, you know, you can have Daily Bugle, but when they made Daredevil, you couldn't. And and the reason I say no is because Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. is shot in L.A., and the, these four shows, four and a half shows, are shot in New York. But, I mean, it's not hard to fly somebody out there. I mean, having a guest star like Lady Sif or having Hawkeye or, or Maria Hill or, or Samuel L. Jackson show up on Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. is something you can use in the ads to get people to come back for the next week. But on this show, there's no tune in next week or, you know, oh, how would we do in the ratings this week? And, oh, this was our lowest rated episode or all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Ratings don't really work in Netflix or whatever. Or they, they do, but we never find out about them. Yeah, we, we don't, we don't hear, hear the numbers. It. They probably know how many people downloaded the show that first day and how many people continue through all 13 episodes that watched the pilot and all that. And, and that will help them decide you know, how many more shows like this to make and stuff like that. But we'll never find out any of that stuff. If Daredevil gets a second season, then we'll be like, okay, then definitely it must have been enough. Or, you know, we'll be able to find out if we work really, really hard, how many people buy the box set of the Daredevil series. 
But uh, my guess is that they're not going to do that. They, they could. They should. But what I think is that they're going to focus on the New York stuff. And so what we'll probably see is people from the shows that are to come show up here. That, that's what I would think. I, I don't know. But people already know this. That's the weird thing is there are people that have seen the 13th episode and we haven't. <laughs> And so, you know, I'm, I sound like a dumbass. Or it's like, what are you talking about? The whole, the whole Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. team shows up in episode 11, which would be awesome if they'd kept that a secret. And that's another thing. is it, It's hard to keep things a secret nowadays. So who knows? You know, it's like three weeks before Avengers comes out, we'll already know who's in the uh, post-credit sequence unless we, you know, plug our ears and start singing the Battle Hymn of the Republic at the top of our lungs. One thing I really, really want to see is Matt Murdock in a courtroom and opposing counsel is Jessica Walters. I want to see that. And if they don't do that, which I'm sure they won't, that's a disappointment. Jessica Walters is a lawyer in the Marvel Universe, and she's Bruce Banner's cousin, and she becomes She-Hulk. And she is owned by Marvel Studios, so it would be really neat if we could see her do that. But, I mean, those are the two big lawyers in the Marvel Universe. (laughs) <laughs> they have uh what was it crusher whatever on the poster so. crusher creel yeah and we saw absorbing man on agents of shield but i you know i think that was just something that the prop department made so that i would love the show <laughs> that was their only reason and so i think we'll see little tiny things like that I, certainly there's no reason in dialogue not to be like you know i was driving by the stark building this morning and there was a wreck right there, you know, something like that. I was driving past Avengers Tower, and Banner was pissing off the 18th floor again, and it was green. You. Sorry, I hope ROAT will cut that line out. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, there's no reason for little things like that not to happen. But, you know, they do that kind of stuff on Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. often as well. Right now, Sky has acquired some sort of power and they'll talk about oh this could be avengers level power you know you could you know well right they compared her to the hulk in that episode and then yeah there's the moment where you see a giant fist print in the steel in the wall and she puts her little hand up to it and oh my gosh it was awesome to just know that the hulk had punched right there and that they take place in the same universe i I, oh gosh i love that and I think most people love that. Yeah. You know, that kind of stuff is is simple to do. Whether we'll get any kind of bleed over from anything else, who's to say? It doesn't seem like these particular series are going to be along those lines because it seems like we're kind of focused on this little area of of down-on-its-luck, downtrodden kind of part of New York and these people who are trying to help out this small area. Whereas Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., they're going to Dubai, and they're going to Chechnya, and et cetera, et cetera, all these kind of out-of-the-way kind of places that you're not going to see in this film. Or, sorry, this TV show. That makes it much less likely that you'll be seeing any Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. people in it or or any of the other, you know, the, the gods... And, you know, the tippity-top superheroes, uh, you know, I don't expect them to come down to that level. But, yeah, the advantage this show has is that it knows that there's going to be 40 episodes following this. Now, they're not necessarily Daredevil episodes, but they're in the same world with the same, I think, creative team, sort of. I don't know. I mean, I like Daredevil has its own showrunner who uh, was going to be Drew Goddard, who directed Cabin in the Woods. But he dropped out to make this show that's not going to happen, called Sinister Six. (laughs) So Stephen Denight is running the show, and Stephen Denight and Drew Goddard were both writers on Angel for Joss Whedon. And they know that eventually, you know, we're going to get Luke Cage, and eventually we're going to get Iron Fist, and whatever villains that they're going to have those guys fight or whatever. And so it would be highly unlikely if we didn't see some of those characters show up or, you know, threads that will be picked up later in a different show or the origins of villains that won't get paid off for a long, long time. They were really taking their time with the Kingpin thing, which the uh, 2003 movie did not do. I mean, the, the, the 2003 Daredevil movie, I, I know people really hate it. 
I can't hate it 100% because Ben Affleck is in it, but it was sort of a Daredevil's greatest hits in one movie. And that was my main problem with it. It was just like, well, hey, they, they, pardon my French, just completely shot their load in that movie so that you would never, ever, 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 ever need another Daredevil movie as long as you lived. This is doing quite the opposite. It's leaving you wanting more and showing you a bunch of doors and saying one of these doors may open, all of these doors may open, none of these doors may open. Stick with us and we'll find out kind of thing, which is what comic books have always done. Right. They know that there's going to be another issue and there's going to be another issue after that. And they want people to keep coming back and buying more. And, they, you know, they want people to get hooked on these things. Yeah. And that's and what good shows, television should be. TV shows are like the comic books of uh, our day, I guess you could say. Uh, not that comic books aren't still around, but... They're barely still around. Right. But TV shows are kind of that same format where you got to make the thing go on and on and on and on, or almost like soap operas or, or something where you got to have a new thing going on every every week. I, I would say comic books and soap operas are really close cousins. They're like Louisiana cousins. They're the same sort of thing. And, 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 and the same sort of plot twists happen in comic books and soap operas. And the thing that keeps you coming back day after day on ABC at 3 o'clock is the exact same thing that keeps you coming back month after month in a Marvel comic or a DC comic. It's, it's you know, intrigue and betrayal and love triangles and disappointment. You know, all that sort of stuff. Shocks, surprises, revelations. You just get a little bit more superhero battles in the comic book thing. Yeah, now you talked about, oh, what's behind this door and what's behind this door. Maybe we'll see, maybe we won't. What doors do you think they will open? After seeing episode one, what do you think we will see in episode 12, 13, etc.? Will we see Bullseye? See, will we see Electra? I'm, I'm pretty old. certain we're going to see... Actually, I guess I can say that I know we will see the Kingpin. Yeah, they, they tip their hands on that really early because we've actually seen him in costume and all that stuff. But I, I, you can't really avoid that in the internet world where, you know, they made the show months ago. And, right. But I wouldn't be surprised if we saw Bullseye. I, I think that would be a disappointment if we didn't. He is the is Daredevil's arch nemesis, not the Kingpin. Kingpin is a Spider-Man villain. <laughs> the Karen Page revelation of her finding out what, who he is, I think we'll see that. Definitely we will see Foggy find out. Definitely we will see what happened to Jack Murdoch. I think we will see what made him such a good fighter. Like uh, in the comics, he went off to the Orient or something like that, and he fought, not he fought, he, he was taken under the tutelage of this man called Stick, who was a ninja kind of thing, and he was taught the, you know, the secret martial arts or whatever, fighting techniques of... Oh, of the Foot Clan? Yeah. How did you know that? Was it, was it the Foot Clan? I don't know. That's teenage mutant. <laughs> the hand. He learned from the the soft master and the hard master. The hand. Oh, is was that GI Joe? The yeah. Foot Clan is GI Joe. No, the Foot Clan was Ninja Turtles. The soft master and the hard master was from GI Joe. Joe. Okay, the hand is, I think, what they're called in the Marvel universe, and I think at that point is when he meets Elektra. One of Daredevil's big loves throughout the years was Natasha Romanoff. Uh, was Black Widow. And gosh, it would be really cool if they could do that, even in one episode. But I don't think that will happen. I think we would have known about it if that was going to happen. It's too big a secret to keep. Right. But If it does happen, it's not a season one thing, probably. But they could have cast a, a really attractive young Mediterranean woman to play Electra Nachos, or however you say her last name. Just Nachos. <laughs> The only other major Daredevil villain that I can think of is Stiltman. And he's just a ridiculously, you know, Silver Age character who is exactly how he sounds. He has a, a suit with mechanical legs that can make him super, super, super tall. And, you know, it's just that's a classic Daredevil villain. <laughs> I don't think we'll ever see Stiltman. I'm sorry. The world is ready for Rocket Raccoon, but they're not ready for Stiltman. Just in the same way that they were not ready for a green and yellow suit on Electro. Will they be ready for a green and yellow suit on Iron Fist? I would bet $50 no, they won't do it. They might do the white suit, 
but I, I don't think they'll do the green and yellow. It would be great to see them do it because all of it has to be is a guy who's in shape. You know what I mean? It's kind of a leotard and a mask. He's got that very plunging neckline that shows his little tattoo on his chest. But yeah, that's, that's a, a product of the 70s or whatever. So the 70s. They really haven't changed that much. <laughs> I, I, just in the same way that you're never going to see a tiara on Luke Cage. Never in a million years. Did Luke Cage wear a tiara? He did, because it was the 70s and it was uh, trying to capitalize on the black exploitation craze. But a tiara? What the hell? How does a tiara go in with black exploitation? Uh, it it's was... not a Disney thing. It's a <laughs> black exploit. What? Okay, I'm sure it was called something else. Okay, I'm looking up Luke Cage tiara right now. Okay, they've already cast Luke Cage and they've already cast Jessica Jones, and and, and it seems like Misty Knight has already been cast. Oh, that tiara you're talking about. I see. I mean, I'm sure there's a name for that, but you know, you and I have been talking about Agents of Shield a lot. Oh, dude, the, the what's the name of the dude? Mac. Is so Luke. Oh gosh, that oh, guy's the yeah. perfect Luke. He looks so much like him, and he's such a likable dude that I was like, "Wow, why, why don't you guys just port him over? Make him be Luke Cage. <laughs> Make him just, you know, he he has to change his identity because of what he knows or something like that, or he gets sent to prison, and he's like, "Well, I'm going to come up with a really cool name, and I really like Nicholas Cage, so I'm going to." And Luke Skywalker, so I'm going to be go. Luke Cage. Because uh, Nicholas's last name is Coppola. Right, yeah, that I did know. I didn't know the reason uh, why he picked Cage. I, I don't know. You know, the thing with Daredevil is he sort of shares a lot of stuff with Spider-Man. Because you see him interact with, like, the Daily Bugle staff. And Foggy Nelson eventually marries Liz Allen, who was Peter Parker's first girlfriend in high school. And, and she was Harry Osborn's widow. And, you know, stuff like that. It's just, you know, they're close knit these guys and Phil Urich is a daily re bugle reporter who ultimately becomes like a daredevil supporting is it Phil? Ben Urich Phil Urich is his son who becomes the hobgoblin eventually. Anyway it's a very incestuous <laughs> world the Marvel uh, the Marvel Universe and I would hope that the Marvel Cinematic Universe becomes as incestuous as all. Mike Coulter is Luke Cage? Yeah. I mean he looks the part but I just, I really like the guy that plays Mac on. Yeah, Age me too. And oh, he's a big dude. He is, yes, very much so. It's interesting that they make him like a mechanic instead of like just the ass kicker because he seems like he should be the ass kicker. Something we've never really talked about is Mockingbird, uh, Bobby Morse, sorry, uh -huh. on Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. is like insanely tall. <laughs> Holy yeah. cow. Oh, she's big. Yeah, well, I mean, they cast her as Wonder Woman in that pilot that didn't go anywhere. Yeah, they did. And, and she uh, was Supergirl. On, she was the first Supergirl on Smallville, the one I liked way more. And, yeah, she's, she's very, very, very tall. Yeah, I really liked the little flashback they had in the last episode where it goes back to when the, the day, day shield, shield fell. fell and Mac is in there with his hands behind his head having to surrender to a bunch of uh, Hydra agents, and then suddenly Mockingbird comes in and just as badass as can be, you know, kicks the door open and is just one of those, you know, here's the superhuman agent kind of a thing. You know, this is James Bond. Well, see, you know how Melinda May has that code name of or nickname the of the Cavalry? Why haven't they said that, that Bobby Morse's nickname is Mockingbird? I, I mean, it, just, it would be not normal. Just the way that I think once they called Natasha Black Widow. Didn't they once on in all the times she's shown up? Didn't they call her Black Widow? Remember? I don't know. I've never paid attention to that. I've just thought of her as Black Widow. So Yeah, they ought to mention it. It's funny that she always wants to be called Bobby. And they never bring up the Mockingbird stuff. Well, it, it's, it's not that they're ashamed. But I think that they're always a little bit skittish about that sort of stuff. Like, well, what if people think that's hokey? What if people, you know, the same reason. Why why not put Danny Rand in a green leotard? Why not? Just say, this guy is so good at martial arts that he doesn't care what he looks like. He's a ninja, man. Ninjas wear ninja outfits. He should wear a ninja outfit. He doesn't and, and, have and to when... have the high collar, the huge yellow collar or something. You can... You know, update it a little to make it more ninja-y and less, less Studio 54, but... 
it should still be a green and yellow ninja outfit. And that's my, I think, my chief complaint about Daredevil. My only complaint, really, is that costume is awful. And it's not even a costume. You know, it's what Hawkeye wears in Avengers. <laughs> it's not even that, because Hawkeye in Avengers has, like, cool leather. He's just wearing, like... A... I know, but it's not the Daredevil costume, and it's certainly not the first appearance Daredevil costume. And somebody told me that when Frank Miller reinvented Daredevil's backstory or whatever, he said, yeah, oh, he, he totally wore black like a ninja or whatever when he was first Daredevil. Fine, but I want him in the Daredevil costume. You know what I mean? I think we'll get it. I think it's coming. I don't think you need to worry too much. We'll 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 see how these things go. I I know that they feel like they're taking a leap, a leap of faith, if you will, every time they do something true to the comics that might be considered silly or hokey or unbelievable or you know too retro or whatever you know. But that's why you get Superman in a gray costume. You know what I mean? That's why you get well the the Electro that we got in last year's. Spider-Man movie, it, okay, it's not as ridiculous as the comics, but it's still ridiculous. There's no way that ILM couldn't have made a guy in a yellow and green suit crackle with energy and his eyes go white and just be a badass, despite the fact that he looks like a, you know, a, a high wire act in a Ringling Brothers Circus thing. Yeah, and I think you'll get there with this. It'll be interesting to see how they work it in, because it's, like we said, it's a really dark, serious kind of a film. How do they work in this red costume with the little horns and the devil outfit? See, I guess it's when they when he comes up with the, the daredevil name or something like that, that we'll probably see that come around. It seems like that kind of is the... Uh, Often the catalyst. That's one of those things that I kind of like about that show, Flash, is when they have uh, Cisco, whose thing is to make up nicknames for everybody. I love that they put that in there, because then they can do those nicknames, and they can call somebody the Weather Wizard. I love that, too. That's a way of shining a light on it to try and take a little bit of the stink off it. But at the same time, I don't feel like they're apologizing for it. It's like, well, there's a character who loves to come up with clever names for it. It's the same way that they did it in Spider-Man 2. Do you remember where he's like, what? we've got to come up with a name for this guy. Um, Doctor the Doctor Impossible. Doctor Strange. Oh, well, Good, it's taken. taken. That, that I loved. It's like, okay, so the, 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 the newspaper came up with a name for him. Or that, you know, Bruce Campbell came up with a name for Spider-Man. The human spider. Oh, that's awful, kid. <laughs> uh, I must have heard Campbell say that line like 19 times that day. <laughs> but it will be difficult to see how superhero-y they dare to go on this show. Because, yeah, some of the stuff that he does is hard to believe. It stretches credibility. And so we'll see how far they, they dare go there. But um, at, at any point do they call him the man without fear? That's Daredevil's subtitle, you know what I mean? That's his his uh, nom de guerre. That's his catchphrase. But I, I, I like that idea that uh, he dares go and do what no one else does. You know, he's he's the Daredevil, and well, we'll see we'll see where they go with it. And and you, if you have had no self control, have already seen where they've gone. Yeah, with it. you're you're sitting there talking back, and you idiot, this is what they did. It's like he totally hangs out with Thor in one scene. Thor gives him the red costume. Like, okay. Thor lets him hold the hammer. <laughs> It'll be fun to find out, and I suppose we can do a follow-up episode. Maybe we can do the follow-up episode when A.K.A. Jessica Jones comes out. That seems like a ways off. But yeah, we'll we'll have It'll to talk be about something. It'll be upon us in no time. That's true. Yeah, we're old, and that's we're the way already the world almost works. halfway through 2015, which is sad. But oh uh, well. Anyway, uh, feel free to tell us what you think of the show in the comments. I mean, I know you won't because nobody ever does. But it would be neat if somebody's like, "Oh, you know, I've loved Daredevil since I was a little kid," and you're totally wrong about whatever it is. So you know, that's neat. Yeah. We're interested to hear. Uh, thanks for listening, everybody, to our Daredevil episode. We'll be back again with an Avengers 2 episode probably very shortly. Ooh, right around the corner. All right. Talk to you later, folks. Have no fear. 
Spider-Man is here. Wait, Daredevil is here. Daredevil? What kind of name is Daredevil? That Gets My Goat is produced under Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives License, which between you and me means nothing. Uh, but yeah, it was a really great pilot. One thing that I've always found kind of weird about a show like this, the sh each show is an hour. Sometimes that just seems incredibly short to develop a full arc. Some Like sometimes I'll, we'll watch The Flash and they'll be like, oh, this stuff and the problems are coming along. And then all of a sudden it's just like, oh, yeah, we won. The end. And you're just like, holy crap, that's all it took? And I'm not sure exactly why it is that it feels like that sometimes. But it's just like, oh yeah, well I just gotta do this. Zoop, zoop, zoop. Okay, now we won. It's over. Well, see, I haven't written a lot of television. I mean, literally, I haven't written any television, okay? But I've written teleplays before. And coming up with, okay, this is how long the teaser is, and this is how long before your first act break, and then coming back from the act break, you don't want people too confused because people are still coming back from the John. And it has to be exactly this amount of time, and, and you're still going to end up having to trim things and, and all that stuff. That is really difficult. And they didn't have to do that on this episode. If you have the list of episodes in front of you, they vary in length. The first episode was 53 minutes long, but they vary from like 48 to 53, just depending on how much story they had to tell in each episode. And because they don't have to have commercial breaks or any of that stuff, they can just do whatever they want. Whereas for a network show, if this were on in uh, ABC, they would have to make little trims. And it's like, okay, well, we still need 30 more seconds for our previously on Daredevil. Okay, so what do we cut out? And it's like, okay, well, there's this extended scene. We're going to lose a little bit of that. That's really frustrating. And sometimes you lose things that you needed. But they, they have a freedom here in not being on a network where, okay, the pilot episode ended up being three or four minutes longer than a normal 50 episode, sorry, a 50 minute show would be. And so you can get us to something like that. You know, with a show like The Flash, I wouldn't be surprised if when that DVD comes out, you know, there's deleted scenes on every single episode. It's like, well, we had to lose a little bit of, uh, what's the girl that never has anything to do on the show? Whose uh, boyfriend is Firestorm. I want to say Felicity, but that's not right. Felicity should be on every effing episode of The Flash. Wait, 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 wait. Her name is... Caitlin Snow. Okay, so you just said her name was Caitlin Snow. I wouldn't be surprised if on every DVD you get two or three Caitlyn scenes that got cut out because, you know, she's going to be the first thing they trim to make the show shorter. And that's too bad. But, you know, that's how it happens. It, every show goes a little long because you try and give everybody in your cast something to do every week. You don't want a Hura syndrome or whatever where she sits around answering the phone and that's it. And so... You know, sometimes sacrifices need to be made, and, and, and it seems like you're feeling that on The Flash. This is a show that has an advantage that other shows don't. And every once in a while, you'll see a show on DVD where it's like an extended pilot that's seven minutes longer, or, you know, they got to put those deleted scenes back into each episode. The episodes of Friends that you rent on Netflix are two or three minutes longer than the episodes of Friends that aired on NBC, which I think is amazing. You know, it's just another way to watch them, and probably a better way to watch them. Yeah, that's really interesting. That's that's a really cool thing about the fact that yeah, there's no commercials. There's this is a pace service, and so you don't need to do that. And there's not even like Hulu, where strangely it's a pace service and you get commercials. But yeah, I mean, that's that's something that's really awesome. They can basically make them like short movies. They don't have to worry. It's just when it's done, it's done. You never have to compromise just to fit in the exact time limit, which has got to be really awesome. I wonder if there will be episodes that are 10 minutes longer or something, you know, just way longer than uh, others just because, you know, they had it. Why not? They shot it. And if there's no reason to cut it out, then why cut it out? Although they do that with movies all the time. 
they cut out scenes even though there's not like there's a time limit. Right, but if a scene is dragging, you feel that, even if it's on, on a movie. And um, I, I would guess that every one of these scripts for Daredevil were 50 pages long. You know, it's like we want it to be the right length. Right. We don't want to have to shoot things and waste our money and cut things out. But, you know, just sometimes fights last longer. Or sometimes somebody improvises something on the set and, and it goes a little bit longer. Or it's like, wow, it, that, that scene was really cool. Let's pull back and give it like 10 more seconds and all that stuff. And to have that freedom is really neat. Another freedom they have on this show is that they didn't have to make a pilot and then shop it around and come back three months later and pick up the series. It was a sold show from the very beginning. And so right. you know, as soon as the pilot was done shooting, they started shooting episode two. And it, it's difficult to make a show and then show it to people. And finally, the people that want to make it say, I like this, but I want you to change this and this and this. You know what I mean? With a show like Star Trek, where it's a year between the pilot and the second episode, everything changes. And so, you know, this, this kind of thing is neat. <laughs> but 